We're back and we're talking about America and the world and the president's next four years. David Axelrod, to the extent that the first term was defined by ending a war in Iraq, ultimately ending a war in Afghanistan, even though it meant surging up troops, what does American engagement in, in the world, if you, as you hear such a difficult scenario that Richard talks about, how does that change the president's posture in the next four years in foreign policy? Well, look, let's just review where we were four years ago. We were involved in two wars, as Richard pointed out, that were mismanaged, and, and we were you know, deeply invested in those with lives and, and dollars. Al-Qaeda was uh, central Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. Afghanistan was still uh, operating uh, largely with impunity. Uh, and our alliances in the world were shredded. Uh, there was tremendous antipathy toward the administration, toward the country. That has all changed. Now, I, will, I think every, everyone at this table would agree the world is a very complicated place. It's a complicated and dangerous place because of a lot of different forces. A guy sets him, himself on fire in Tunisia, a whole region goes up uh, and, you know, because of, of social media. Uh, so we are living in a different world, and what we need to do is to be, uh, be smart about how we engage, where we engage, because one thing we can't do is project force everywhere in the world. We, we don't have the resources, and it's not a smart way to proceed. It's interesting, Jeff, we are projecting what, force all over the world. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, the drone policy is spread all over the world, and that's sort of what we're know, known by best. And to the Arab Spring, the United States was not a passive observer in this. Yes. A fruit vendor in Tunisia set himself on fire. Yes, there was social media that helped spread this, uh, this enthusiasm for change. But the United States did turn its back on Mubarak in Egypt. And I think we're going to look back and see that as one of the most important decisions that President Obama ever made. And, and, you and know, we're not sure if it was the right I, one or I, not. I, I, I uh, am deeply respectful of you and your experience, and like everyone, happy to see you sitting at this table. But uh, do you believe that we could hold back the tide of history, that if the United States had made a different decision, that ultimately yes, those forces it, wouldn't it have It wouldn't have happened. Time? Syria wouldn't have happened. The revolution in Libya would have started, and the rebels would have lost. Uh, things would have been very different had that decision not been taken. Was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? I don't think we know yet, but it was a very pivotal decision. It raises I don't question. think things would have uh, gone on as they continued. No, it's a, the, this right. is a But Joe, be Joe Scarborough, for, for instance, if you take the issue time. of Syria, how does the United States, a second Obama turn, try to affect the end game? if it's a post-Assad Syria, which, as Richard has laid out, could be so dangerous? Well, we have to understand there are limits to American power. We can't go into Syria uh, and, and affect that outcome dramatically. We did make a choice in Egypt, and there were a lot of diplomats from the Middle East that were calling me ahead of time uh, that I'm friends with, saying it was a terrible mistake and would rue the day that we made that decision. We abandoned a friend of 30 years. That's something that historians are going to have to make, make up their minds on. But when it comes to foreign policy, and I want to push back a little bit on Richard as well. And Richard, I'm glad you're back too. But don't you like Axelrod says he's glad you're back, <laughs> glad you weren't killed, but... Yes. Let me make my point. What's <laughs> well, kind of well, but, but, but listen, you know, the, the, the thing is, though, um, so much of, of the United States' power now is not going to be, we're, we're not going to project power by dropping drones in country after country after country where we haven't even declared war. There is going to be a terrible backlash of that. But I hate to keep going back to it, but how we handle our debt, Medicare, Medicaid, the long-term debt. I mean, because we're, we're, we're going well, to... Well, I didn't hear we're, it. We're, we're you going to turn this discussion of your issues. Who wants to turn <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on a second. Wait. wait. We're, we're listen, about, we're going about. to own the 21st century based on soft power, not based on missiles that we're dropping. Well, well, we can't fair. occupy every country that's dysfunctional. This is an appropriate final area, Doris, because this is ultimately about how you craft legacy, which is what second terms are about. And despite our concern about second-term curses, you know, Nixon resigning, Bush overreaching, and, and Clinton impeached, it is a great opportunity for us. And hardly any president has been historic without a second term. Mm. But I think, to go to Joe's point, one of the legacy questions will be to, to Richard and us combined. Eleanor Roosevelt said during World War II, you can't fight for democracy abroad without strengthening it at home. And I still think that strengthening democracy at home, getting our middle class rising again, figuring out inequality of income, dealing with entitlement, dealing with our fiscal problems, that has to be a priority, even as we step abroad. If, that's the first economist quote. They say we've screwed up home, and so then, then, then they argue that we're not engaged enough abroad. You have to do both. 
and the question is management of time. I think the most important thing, hopefully the president learns in the first term after four years, how did I spend my time? Did I spend enough time with Congress or too much time? Enough time with the press or too much time? Enough time with the people? Enough time on foreign? Enough time on domestic? He's got a limited number of hours in the day, and that's the best thing you can learn. You become a better president after those four years, hopefully. Uh, David Ashford, I have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. The president famously said to Medvedev of Russia, tell President Putin I'll be more flexible in my second term. No, I don't know that he said flexible, but I think I'll have more flexibility. Said, right. uh, yeah, I'll have more flexibility in my second term. What do you mean by that? I don't know. I never asked him about that, Tom. <laughs> uh, but, I, but let me um, slide over and evade your question and talk and, and, no, and, and, and try Russia, no, 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 look, I think that it's clear that when you're in the middle of an election campaign, whoever you are, you have less flexibility. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, but I think more was made more and more. a different kind of relationship with Russia, which is, after all, a behemoth out there that we're not talking yeah. about very much, and it's got big stakes in I think Iran, we have to, we, I think places. we have to deal with Russia. They're a player on a number of, of issues that are important to us, and we have to feel out the relationship now with Putin, who's being very aggressive. But I just I, want to make one, I want at a time. Okay. We've got about five seconds I don't here. think that the United States of America can yeah. be effective if we stand with the forces of, uh, uh, of autocracy against the, I gotta, the yearning for freedom. I, I, mean, I think that that's just fundamental. I apologize. I've got to make that the final word. Uh, thanks to all of you here.